Hello there. I often find myself on the food portions of both YouTube and pretty much every social media I frequent. And recently I saw a video that I thought would be a really good idea for today. And that video came from Brian Lagerstrom and he did a video talking about what pantry essentials he will always splurge on versus the ones he won't. Now it was a very fun, interesting, educational video. I really like his content. So I'll link it down below, but it led me to thinking about what coffee essentials I always splurge on versus the ones I I don't think you need to spend that much money on. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna start off with the four items slash things that I think you should always invest a little bit more in. And then at the very end, we'll touch on the two that I don't think you really need to. Again, kind of prefacing this, these are kind of my priorities and things that I believe in, but your priorities might be a little bit different. So if you have different essentials that you splurge on, I would very much like to hear about them, both kind of on like why, but also just what they are. I think it's very interesting to talk about. So. Without further ado, let's get started. Now this first one might seem a little bit simple. The first thing I think you should always splurge on over really anything else is coffee. Now, <laughs> that might be like, okay, Captain Obvious, but, but hear me out here. One of the most common questions I get on this channel and DMs on comments on anything is gonna be what coffee machine should I get that will make my coffee just the best coffee ever? I don't usually have a good answer to it beyond well, what coffee are you using? Because really your input is gonna matter a lot more than what you're putting that input through. There is no one machine that fits all. There is no one answer of like, this is the machine that will always make you the best cup of coffee. However, I can tell you that if you invest in better coffee, you will have a better result. With all things, coffee takes practice. It takes kind of understanding what your preferences are. But if you're willing to put in that effort, if you're willing to put in a little bit of the investment that that takes, it will pay off far more than a, like a really, really steep initial investment into a machine that you're still putting subpar coffee through. Now, I think when people are asking these questions, they're often still kind of in the zone of like shopping in like grocery store coffee. And that is a great place to start. It's frankly where I started. However, if you're in the search for a better cup of coffee, it might be time to branch out of that a little bit. Usually what I recommend to folks is to check out your local roaster or check out your local coffee shop. The very first question you should be asking is really just to your barista. Ask what they're serving and what they're excited about. Most coffee shops will sell coffee of some type, whether it's coffee that they roast or if it's from like the distributor or wholesaler that they serve coffee from, for lack of a better word. I don't know why I, <laughs> I ran out of that sentence. As a seasoned barista, this is a question I have answered many, many, many times. And frankly, it's really fun to help people find the coffee that's gonna get them started on this journey or just kind of get them excited. Usually this means the coffee costs a little bit more, but that is very okay. Frankly, coffee should cost a little bit more. It's a product that has a lot of labor going into it on like all ends of the supply chain. And you'll notice the difference. Good coffee is really, really, really good. Now, if you are someone who does not have a coffee scene around you, be it cafes or roasteries or whatever, there are a lot of really, really great resources across the web that will help you uh, get introduced to different roasteries that you might feel more comfortable or interested in ordering from. Number one thing I will always splurge on, it's coffee. I'm gonna go grab the products for our next thing because we have something that is very similar and yet, maybe slightly different. I'll be right back. I wanna give a huge thank you to Trade for sponsoring today's video. I've been working with Trade for a long time and appreciate how easy they make it to explore different types of coffees and profiles that I might not have otherwise found. With over 450 coffees to choose from, Trade is a subscription service that's perfect for the avid coffee drinker or the newbie. Now, I'm a pretty big fan of cold brew and I think the cold brew chronicles this summer has proven that. So you can only imagine my excitement when I found out that Trade was launching cold brew kits this summer. The kit includes two pounds of coffee Coffee, along with a set of cold brew bags that make it incredibly easy to brew without any special equipment. The kit also comes with detailed instructions so you'll have the absolute best chance at the best cup possible. This coffee was a true medium roast, which tends to be my preference when brewing cold brew, and it resulted in a cup that has smooth milk chocolate flavors, a hint of lemon acidity, and dark cherry. So if you're ready to get started, Trade is offering 15% off your first order with a cold brew subscription. This allows you to try a variety of roasts from around the country, enabling you to make the best cold brew all year long. Head over to drinktrade.com MDC to get brewing today. Now, the number two thing that I will always splurge on is milk. 
<laughs> once more, it might seem obvious, or maybe this one seems less obvious, but hear me out on this. If you are someone who likes milk drinks in whatever proportion, it is more than likely that milk makes up 50, if not 80% of your drink. And if we're investing in good coffee and we're looking for a good output, should probably care what that other part is as well. Now, speaking specifically to the US where my experience is, most specialty cafes will default to whole milk. That's kind of the, the standard across the board. Whole milk is generally milk that has about a 3.5% fat content. That sentence is always so hard for me to say. I had to say percent fat content in competition and it was just like garbage every time. It was just like one kind of like, I just kind of like threw up the syllable. <laughs> <laughs> and called it good. But anyways, 3.5% fat content. Now you might be saying, does it really matter what kind of milk I buy? Because milk just kind of tastes the same. And I would push back with, well, <laughs> not all milks taste the same, nor are they all made equal. So here are some of my recommendations on how to find really, really good milk to pair with your coffee. The first thing I recommend checking out is local dairies. Usually if you're at a more specialty grocery store, or maybe even in a more standard one, you will find some dairies that are exclusive to your region. I have this right here because Alpenrose is a dairy that is local to the Portland, kind of like Northern Oregon area. And it's one that I really like buying from. This happens to be one of their whole milks that has a higher fat content. Um, and you'll start to see some of that variation uh, within dairies, which is kind of fun to explore. One thing I highly recommend people do is kind of a flavor experiment. If they are looking to up their coffee game, specifically in the milk beverage territory, is to pick up a couple different whole milks from different dairies. So that might be one that is more like national and then a couple that are local or all local or whatever have you. Anyways, pick up a couple whole milk. So all that are like kind of a 3.5% fat content. Try not to say that as much. <laughs> and then make beverages that you can taste side by side with them. Now, this could be done simply by making some steamers, just like steam up each of the milk and taste them side by side, or you could make coffee drinks with them. With doing this, I do recommend kind of a, a smaller proportion. I recommend like a Cortado, like a one-to-one -one ratio is a pretty solid like way to experience milk. Make three Cortados with your three different milks, all using the same coffee and then taste them side by side. More likely than not, you will notice that there are some differences. Some some milks tend to be a little bit saltier. Some tend to be a little bit sweeter. Some taste a little bit more waterier. There's just like a whole range of kind of what milk can be. And you'll find, this is all to personal preference, but you'll find that there's probably one you like the most. And so start there, start using that milk. Milk is an ingredient, milk has variation. And so finding the one that pairs best with your coffee will pay off a lot in the long run. Now, that was a whole lot of talk about dairy milk, but similarly, we also have alternative milks. What I'm about to talk about here applies to all alternative milks. I have two options of oat milk in front of me because that's my personal preference, but this is, this is broader than that. Now, as many of you know, I'm not someone who can really easily drink dairy. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't treat me so well anymore. Usually my experiences with dairy involve like a, a a lot of lactate. So I often opt for alt milks. And when I do that, there's a very specific type of alternative milk that I look for. You'll notice something that is similar about both of these packaging is that they have the word barista across them. So this one has barista series and this one says barista edition. Oh no, it says barista blend, I lied. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, these are barista options of alternative milks. Both of these companies offer like standard oat milks. They, it's like non, it's just like your normal like store-bought oat milk. However, if you are pairing your oat milk with coffee or your alternative milk with coffee, you should be on the lookout for barista blends. These are formulated specifically to pair and enhance coffee and to also interact and like hold the, the attributes of like latte milk that we look for. Now, the reason we default in most coffee shops to whole milk is that the combination of fat and sugars and proteins and lactic acid and like all this stuff that is in whole milk it pairs really nicely with coffee. As you heat it, those sugars start to like caramelize. Essentially, it becomes sweeter. There's this micro foam that like forms when you add heat and air, and it's just a wonderful combination. Now doing that with alternative milks, it's a little bit tricky, and that's why these are barista additions versus the other side. This leads to barista additions usually being a little bit more expensive, but it's fully worth it if you are looking for that like cafe quality, almost whole milk emulating like kind of flavor and texture. Even as someone who has worked as a barista for a very, very long time, I have a really, really difficult time getting non-barista milks to either foam, 
poor or taste as good as their barista counterparts. And really, they're just not made for it. Like blasting them with air and heat is, is not what they're for. They're for baking or drinking or adding to cereal. There's a whole list of things that those milks are for, but pairing with coffee and steaming is not usually one of them. So if you are shopping for milks, highly recommend local dairies, highly recommend tasting different types. If you are shopping for alternative milks, find your barista additions that you can get your hands on. Okay, we are zipping right along. <laughs> Let's get into some gear. This is one of my coffee tools that I have splurged on, and I will probably continue to splurge on whenever, if ever, it breaks. This right here is a WDT tool, and that WDT stands for Weiss Distribution Technique. And this is something you may have seen before, especially on the internet. This is a tool and a technique that has been around for, for quite a while. However, I feel like it's garnered at least a lot of visibility in the last like couple of years. Often when you see those very elaborate like coffee setups or like puck preparation videos, you'll see like WDT incorporated in some way. As a quick overview, in case you don't know, this is essentially what it is. So we have this little tool here and we have a lot of very, very fine needles on the end. So you have your portafilter. Let's say you have some coffee in here. You're gonna place this basically at the bottom, kind of on the edge here. And then you're gonna start making little circles. While you're making these circles though, you're gonna be making bigger circles that spiral up to the top of the bed. And essentially what the goal here is to break apart any clumps, any like gaps that have formed, like little air gaps that might impede the extraction later on once you tamp. So you're just swirling around and these little needles are raking through everything, making it nice and consistent and homogenous all the way through. This form of distribution, I think is really great. I learned a lot about it in the past year and a half while I was competing and using this technique. And now I think it's something that's awesome and I recommend to a lot of people. However, there is kind of a contingency with it. And it's that you kind of need the right tool to do it. There are a lot of kind of like quick and easy like wrecks and like things I've seen out there where people kind of like jack together like a WDT tool using things that are a lot wider than these needles. And ultimately that does you a lot more harm than it does good. Because you're raking through your entire bed of espresso, you're trying to like create consistency so channels don't form in the puck. However, if you're using needles that are very large, if they are unevenly spaced, if they are if they are just wrong in any way, you're likely to create channels in your puck rather than, you know, dissolving them. Now there are people far more qualified than I out there who have kind of figured out the ideal diameter and also just sizing and spacing of the needle. So I wanna to refer to them real quickly. There was an article I was reading in Stand Art recently that was specifically talking about the history and also kind of the mechanics of WDT. And in it, Lance Hedrick gave some really nice numbers uh, that I think are just valuable to kind of know if you are shopping around for a WDT tool. So according to Lance's recommendations, the needle should be 0.3 millimeters with a spread of 29 millimeters. This is kind of the ideal station of like, it's fine enough to rake everything up, but you aren't creating larger gaps or channels in the puck as you go. Maybe that information is helpful to you, maybe it's not, but at the very least, I can give you a recommendation on what tool I think you should get if you are looking for a WDT tool. This one right here, I've talked about it before. <laughs> it's been on my like gift list before. It is one from Swark Designs. Um, this is the one I have used in competition in multiple years past. The the build of it is very nice. It's substantial. It comes with a stand. The needles are the right diameter. They're the right spread. They fit really well. It just all feels very luxurious, very permanent. And I highly recommend this if this is a method of distribution you're looking into. And I'll link it down below. Of course, there are plenty other WDT tools on the market that are also great, but this would be my recommendation. It served me very well. And I think if it's something you're interested in doing, this is kind of the route you should go. Okay, that was a lot of science. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about something else now. Now the last coffee thing that I do think you should splurge on is gonna be your pitchers. I have two here in front of me. One of them is my preferred pitcher and the other one is a more standard like default pitcher that was just included with a machine. Most higher end espresso machines that you receive will come with a pitcher of some type. It's a pretty standard accessory nowadays. And of course online, there are plenty of like, kind of like cheaper options as well. It's a pretty easy shape to make. But there are some pretty clear differences between these two that lead me to loving this one a whole lot more than I love this cheaper, a little bit more 
more default one. First off, just kind of looking at it from this top down, you can see a lot of differences in the spouts. Probably the most noticeable is gonna be that this one has a much wider lip and is also a lot more rounded than this one is. Something you can probably see a little bit better from the side here is that this one extends quite a bit more than this spout does. Additionally, when you look at the walls here, this one is a lot more straight up and down, whereas this one has a much bigger curve that kind of tapers off to the top here. This picture was specifically designed for people who are wanting to learn better latte art. They are looking to kind of perform better. And I think the best way I can kind of describe how this one works better is that this is your paintbrush for your latte art. Your cup is your canvas. It's all very poetic, but think of this as your paintbrush and wanting to invest in good paintbrushes. Now, one of the reasons that this kind of extended curved spout is really, really helpful versus this more standard shallow sharp spout is that when you have a cup here, your latte art starts when you're able to reach in with your pitcher and get really close to the surface of the milk. Kind of the two steps of latte art is that you're gonna be filling up, you're gonna be incorporating that milk and espresso together, and then once you have filled up to a point where you can reach in, you start your design. With this being a much like more extended spout, you are able to do that a lot sooner than you are with this one. Whereas here, I have to fill up a lot more to really be able to get close. By starting my latte art sooner rather than later, I'm able to get a bigger spread in the cup. The design tends to look more proportional and I also have just more time in general to be able to make a more complicated design. The more full my cup is before I start pouring, the less options I have. Additionally, with this more kind of curved shape to it, you'll find that you have a, I think an easier flow of milk. More milk is gonna flow out of this. It's also gonna flow in a little bit of a wider shape than this very, very sharp spout. I find that tends to be a lot easier for beginners to work with rather than something that's sharp here, where you really have to work to get the milk to move out of the pitcher. This pitcher, of course, is gonna be a little bit more expensive and I think it's fully worth it because these things will last you forever. Once you find a pitcher you like, you can, you can kind of just stop. <laughs> Unless you are someone who is chucking your pitcher around and frankly, even if it's dented, it still probably works pretty well. This should last you most of your barista career. Just as kind of a, a fun side note, I actually have the first picture I ever bought myself as a barista, like six years ago, right here. This is a little tiny picture. It's from Barista Hustle. It has a very, very rounded, uh, very extended spout. It's very, very small. And this is a picture that has served me extremely well over the years. I've used this in like, every competition. It's gone to like four different continents. <laughs> it's been through the ringer. It still looks great. It still works wonderfully. Uh, and I'm super happy with it. Pictures are important. They are paint brushes. Um, I highly recommend finding one that you like and sticking with it. Okay. <laughs> so those were all the things that I will always splurge on in my coffee setup, but I do have two things that I don't splurge on. Now, the number one thing I will never splurge on or really even buy is gonna be coffee syrups. I made an entire video about this kind of a couple months ago, um, talking about some of my standard syrups that I make at home, and I will link that down below. But I find that most commercially available syrups often have a higher level of artificial flavors or preservatives to keep them shelf stable that just end up not tasting very good. They kind of end up tasting a little bit fake. And if you're someone who likes sweet coffee, which I am occasionally that person, it can be well worth your time to kind of invest in learning how to make infused syrups yourself. They are super easy. A simple syrup recipe is very easy to make with minimal ingredients. And then once you have that down, you can really add anything to it. Spices, fruits, nuts, berries, chocolate, <laughs> whatever you want. The world is your oyster when it comes to syrups. Additionally, I think one of the really great benefits too is that when you make syrups at home, they are often two to three to sometimes four times cheaper than if you were buying syrups in store. Kind of going along that same line of thought, when you're making your syrups at home, you have the option to moderate how much you're making. So this is something that has happened to me before. I will get a syrup, I will have like a third of it, and then by the time I'm a third through the syrup, I would like to try a different flavor. <laughs> I'd like to explore out a little bit, but I'm kind of locked into this huge jar until it's done. This often leads to kind of like excess of spending into new syrups and often just kind of waste of old syrups. However, since simple syrups are basically just a proportion of water to sugar, you can really scale them up or down to however much you like. If you want to just make enough syrup for like, 
six drinks over the course of the week, that's super easy to do. So syrups are not something I buy very often. They're probably not something I will ever buy very often. I find it much more fulfilling and also just economical to make them myself. Now, we have one more thing. <laughs> here is the piece of gear that I will probably never ever splurge on. You might recognize these right here. These are knock boxes. And if you don't know what those are, they are coffee trash cans. I have two different versions here, but they function the exact same. You have this kind of like little crossbar right here. So when you are done making your espresso, you take your portafilter, you whack it on the bar, your puck comes out, it stays in here. Even at their cheapest, knock boxes usually start at around $20. They can very easily go up to 50 and sometimes they're a lot more expensive than that. And if you were looking for something to kind of cut down on the costs of your espresso bar or what have you, this is definitely something you can drop. I fully understand if you want it aesthetically to batch everything, if you want to keep your coffee set up entirely isolated. However, a solution that I have used in the past and still use pretty often to this day is to just knock the puck into the trash can or the compost bin. This can be very easily done. If you are looking to knock out a puck, all you have to do is kind of whack the portafilter on this little edge right here that's closest to the handle. It will do the same thing. The puck will drop out into your trash or compost and you're good to go. The very first cafe I ever worked at, we did this for years. No knock box, just a trash can. I like these. I do like having a knock box, but is it necessary? Probably not. Those are the four coffee things I will always splurge on and the four that I won't. Now, this was overall <laughs> very fun to do. And again, as I said at the beginning, I'm very curious what everyone else's kind of priorities or preferences are. So feel free to leave those down in the comments below. But as usual, my name is Morgan. You can find me here on Instagram once a week, plus here on Instagram, we're on YouTube. <laughs> You can find me here on YouTube once a week, plus YouTube shorts. You can also find me on Instagram or TikTok pretty much every single day. That was it. I don't have a copy to walk off with. So until next time, have a good day. I'll see you later.